everybody, and happy holidays, and welcome to Monday Night Travel. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of being the Rudolph that is guiding this sleigh tonight as Rick takes us across Europe, doling out travel memories like gifts for all of us to enjoy. And now, without further ado, I would love to welcome our guest for this evening. It's Jolly Old St. Rick. <laughs> Rick, happy holidays. Oh. Happy holidays, Gabe. I got my holiday hat. Don't get to wear and this guess very what? often. Well, so there do we I. <laughs> and it's a great way to finish off a year of Monday night travels with um, a little Christmas party. So thank you for the introduction. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight as we uh, celebrate travel as we like to do every Monday night. So I'm going to be with you here. I've got my uh, treats that I'm going to be enjoying as we travel. I've got some panettone, and I like to put that into the broiler and, and um, melt some some butter onto it. Uh, the panettone, and we'll talk a little more about this later on, but it's Italian for the big bread. It's big panettone, and this is a sweet bread. It's a sweet bread with raisins, and that is a big deal in Italy. I want to be uh, careful to uh, include my Norwegian heritage. So here, if you see that, that baby is krumkaka and krumkaka is one reason to go to norway especially in the holiday season mm. i just love krumkaka bless my grandma's heart and uh, i'll be nibbling on that i've got some homemade biscotti that i want to dunk into my hot chocolate and i'm going to take this hot chocolate and i'm going to embellish it with a little bit of peppermint schnapps and that is what we call a Heidi Coco. All right. So we're going to start with a little Christmas. Then we're going to go traveling. I'm going to take you on a quick greatest hit sweep through the um, travels I enjoyed in 2023. And then we're going to finish up with a little more Christmas travels. Um, we're going to start in Germany and Austria with a little bit of holiday traditions there. And we're going to finish in Switzerland. We're also going to have a chance for Q and A's. And as uh, uh, Gabe and Ben and my Monday night travel crew always are very thoughtful in putting some very important links in the chat section. And um, Gabe and Ben will be organizing the questions and uh, we'll get a bunch of them after the PowerPoint presentation. But right now, I just want to thank you for joining us. And I'm going to take you to where should we go? I think Nuremberg is the place everybody dreams about when they go to Germany because Nuremberg is the place with the greatest Christmas market. So we're gonna to go to a Christmas market in Germany. We're gonna see how gingerbread is made. We're gonna visit that Christmas market and see the celebration so important in Germany. Um, they do it in a, in, a, in a way that is green and traditional. No imported knickknacks. If you're gonna have yourself a, a mug of uh, hot spiced wine, it's gonna be in an actual mug rather than a styrofoam throwaway cup. And you'll leave a little deposit and they bring your mug back to get that refund on your deposit. But it's a very green, it's a very local festival, and it's a very traditional festival. So that's a lot of fun. And um, I think I'll take you right there now. This is from our Christmas special that we produced oh, about 15 Christmases ago. And I just love to dust this thing off and share it with all my traveling friends each Christmas. And as I'll be reminding you, this is a one hour show. I'm just going to show you 10 or 15 minutes of it tonight. And we're going to start with Germany. We'll be back when dinner's ready. But first, we've got some shopping to do in Germany. When it comes to traditional holiday images, Germany's Bavaria is the heartland. Here, we'll savor classic holiday themes, glittering trees, old time carols, and colorful Christmas markets. These markets, called Christkindl markets, enliven squares throughout Germany. The most famous is here in Nuremberg. It's a festive swirl of the heartwarming sights, sounds, and smells of Christmas. Long a center of toy making in Germany, a woody and traditional ambiance prevails. Now they got these nutcrackers, and I saw this nutcracker jabbering away saying nothing. And I thought, I'm going to try to lip sync my next line to his wooden jaw going back and forth. I don't know if it works, but it's just fun to be in the markets. And it's fun to post produce that as we make our TV shows for you and public television. 
See if the lip syncing works. Nutcrackers are characters of authority, uniformed, strong jawed, and able to crack the tough nuts. Smokers, with their fragrant incense wafting, feature common folk like this village toy maker. Prune people, with their fig body, walnut head, and prune limbs, are dolled up in Bavarian folk costumes. And hovering above it all is the golden Rausch Angel, an icon of Christmas in Nuremberg. Rausch is the sound of wind blowing through its wings. It's a favorite for capping family Christmas trees. Bakeries crank out old-fashioned gingerbread, the Leibkuchen Nuremberg, using the original 17th century recipe. Back then, Nuremberg was the gingerbread capital of the world, and its love affair with gingerbread lives on. Shoppers can also munch the famous Nuremberg breakfast, skinny as your little finger. And sip hot spiced wine. As in so many cultures, kids love their local version of Santa Claus. While Santa is a legend, his character is based on Saint Nicholas, a kind and generous bishop who actually lived in Turkey in the fourth century. Holiday gift giving, especially in Catholic regions, is often associated with the feast day of Saint Nicholas, December 6. So now Germany has so many rich traditions and a lot of them we have in our culture without even knowing it. I mean, I think the Germans were the first to have a tree and actually decorate it for Christmas. And if you study your history, you know that uh, until the 1500s, all of Europe was Roman Catholic in its style of Christianity. And then they had huge wars and a big commotion with the Reformation and the borderline was about halfway through Germany. So north of that would be Protestant and south of that would be Roman Catholic. Luther was the big heretic that finally broke the church apart. And he didn't like the Catholic focus on, on uh, uh, St. Nicholas so much. He wanted to bring the focus back to Jesus, the Christ child. So instead of St. Nick giving presents, in Germany they have, in much of Germany, they have this Christkind that gives the presents. And it was at first baby Jesus that was going to give the presents, but that didn't make sense. So the Christkind, the Christ child, morphed into an angelic young lady, a woman. And she is called the Christkind to this day. And we get to meet her, her in just a moment. And she is such a rock star with the kids, the Christkind. In fact, there's a touching, a beautiful moment with all the adoring kids gather around. I'll never forget this. She goes, if you're very gentle, you can touch my wings. I just love that. It was so much fun being in Nuremberg for this German style Christmas. But Germany is Luther country. Back in the early 1500s, the great reformer Martin Luther wanted to humanize the Christmas story by shifting the focus away from the saints and back onto the birthday boy, Jesus. Rather than jolly old Saint Nick bringing the goodies on December 6th, Luther established the idea that gifts would be given on the 25th by the Christ child, or in German, Christkind. But for kids, it was hard to imagine the little baby in the manger delivering gifts. So an angel served as the gift-giving Christ child. And somehow, the angel came to be represented by a young girl. She spends her reign spreading the joy of the season. The Christkind concludes by telling the enthralled children, if you're very, very gentle, you can touch my wings. Nuremberg's favorite angel then leads her fans into the children's section of the market, where expertly bundled kids enjoy a Christmas wonderland. Now we cross the border into Austria, to the town that to me always feels like Christmas, Salzburg. With its old town gathered under its formidable castle, Salzburg celebrates the holidays with an alpine elegance. Christmassy shopping lanes delight browsers. Markets are busy as shoppers gather last minute holiday decorations and perhaps a fresh sprig of mistletoe. These Tyrolians celebrate the... I'm in that little fort in the background covering my ears. I just had to duck out of the camera's view and it was thunderous loud as these guys were shooting off their little handheld cannons. Season in noisier fashions as well. 
from the castle ramparts high above town, traditional gunners fire away as they have since the days when they really believed these shots would scare away evil spirits. <laughs> well, there you go. That's a noisy tradition. So many interesting traditions all across Europe. It was so much fun to make this TV show. By the way, if you want to watch the whole TV show, it's a tradition for a lot of people. I just was so happy to be able to bring a non-commercial, sacred, traditional Christmas celebrating different cultures' ways of enjoying the holiday season to bring that home. And uh, we did it, as I mentioned, uh, about 15 years ago, and that it's still it just feels fresh. It's just a wonderful, wonderful way to take a moment and remember the traditions and how they celebrate um, Christmas across Europe. Salzburg was a particularly good place to celebrate the uh, Christmas holiday. Uh, thinking that, I went back when we did our Easter show and totally struck out. It didn't work for Easter, but it is great for Christmas. This, of course, is uh, right outside of Salzburg was where Silent Night was first composed and performed. Uh, we had a terrible rainy night, so we couldn't do much with the Silent Night thing. We did happen to be in Salzburg on Christmas Eve, went to the big cathedral there, and the cathedral is built on a one quarter scale of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And, you know, this is the hometown of Mozart, so music's a big deal. The complete back wall of the cathedral was a wall of music. You had a full orchestra, you had a choir, and it was just, a, the mass was just a musical delight. Um, and it's so fun to be in one of these churches when it's just filled with incense and music and worshipers. Check this out in Salzburg. Salzburg, nicknamed the Rome of the North, has a magnificent cathedral, inspired by St. Peter's at the Vatican. Locals here in the town of Mozart pack the place to mix worship with glorious music. It was here in the region of Salzburg that the most loved carol of the Christmas season, Silent Night, was sung for the first time nearly 200 years ago. According to legend, a local priest went out one Christmas night to bless a newborn baby. As he walked home in the snow, he was so moved by the stillness of the starlit and holy night that he wrote a poem about it. He gave the poem to Franz Gruber, the organist in his church, who composed a simple tune. On Christmas Eve, 1818, the carol was sung for the first time, accompanied only by a guitar. one of Europe's more traditional corners. It this was so exciting. I wanted to just connect with the family. That's the challenge when you're traveling, is to not feel like you're living out of a hotel and, and just uh, seeing things up on, on uh, billboards, but you're, you're connecting with the people. And um, we had two dinners with two local families, one in Nuremberg and one in Salzburg. And I knew we'd be dealing with little children and different families, and we couldn't count on one of them working, but I thought if we did two, it'd be great. One of them would be great. The Nuremberg one was just didn't work. It was just no fun. Um, so, but we confused that family and all their kids by buying them literally the moose and the Christmas tree and everything well before Christmas and the kids there celebrated Christmas twice with the camera rolling. But this one in Salzburg in the uh, home of a tour guide friend of mine, Christiana Schneeweiss, uh, it was just a beautiful family, beautiful traditions and a horse drawn sleigh. And it was one of the most exciting, but also nerve wracking experiences because as you look at this horse-drawn sleigh, you can see it's a little bit dark. When you're trying to shoot during twilight, you have a very, very narrow window, and you got to get it all done before it was after it was too light, but before it's too dark. And this was just at the edge, but we we're able to pull it off, 
and then because uh, it's cumbersome try turning a, a, a horse-drawn sleigh around when you need to get a second take it's just not going to work and uh, also there's the local politeness and and we had to just kind of be no worry we got the camera rolling it's getting dark and then we went in and it was just the most delightful family scene i just the the whole idea of this traditional christmas and the little children picking up the traditions from the fa- parents it was so so fun to capture it on film and bring it home Strong Catholicism and a love of heritage shine especially brightly at Christmas time in the countryside. We're visiting the Weissacher family farm. Frohe Weihnachten. Come to Rhein, bitte. Okay. This family happily shares its love of the season with a guest. Like just about anywhere, part of Christmas is making cookies with Grandma. Guess what you're doing this year? More unique to Austria is this ritual in which the dad blesses the home with incense as his daughter follows with holy water. The prayer is for a healthy and happy new year. Maria teaches her daughters how the Advent wreath marks the four weeks of Advent, the season of preparation leading to the advent or arrival of Jesus. Ancient peoples were the first wreath makers. For Christians, that evergreen circle came to symbolize everlasting life. The candles, one for each week, reminded them that the birth of their savior was approaching. Austrians lovingly decorate their tree, but keep it secret and hidden from the children until December 24th arrives. Oh my goodness. Christmas is coming. So uh, that was just a little look at Christmas in Germany and Austria. We're gonna go later on to Christmas in Switzerland. But right now I thought I would just take a moment and um, I'm gonna juice up my hot chocolate here with some, oh no, I got to get this open, my schnapps, there you go, ha, this has been waiting a long time, I get my peppermint schnapps out, Christmas time, and you know, we invented a drink, me and my friend Walter at Hotel Mid Doghorn in Willowald, we called it, people wanted, way up there after a nice day of hiking, they wanted something Nice and sweet, but with a little kick to it. And everybody loves their German schnapps or their Swiss schnapps. So we had this hot chocolate and put some uh, peppermint schnapps in it. Oh yeah, and we called it a Heidi Coco. People thought it was an old tradition, dated back to 1988. And it sold very well, and I know why. Okay, we're going to go um, just review what I was able to do this last year. I just thought for this uh, Christmas version, uh, this holiday version of Monday Night Travel, I would just share with you in a just kind of a quick swing, the fun I had in 2023 traveling. And um, it was a delightful year to travel, I'll tell you that. And uh, we're thankful that we're back in the saddle now with our... um, uh with our with our travels after the pandemic and we had a wonderful year and i was able to travel all over the place um you know just before when we were in nuremberg we were having that delightful visit to christiana's house and i was going to have some of my hmm my panettone delicioso Ooh, with my peppermint schnapps schmeckt sehr gut okay Okay, I'm going to just go now and take you around Europe. And thanks so much for joining us on this holiday special. And right now, I'm just going to take a trip down 2023 memory lane. And it's kind of a big year coming up because this is 50 years since my first trip um, after graduating from high school, 50 years, and also 40 years after the first edition of our book, Europe Through the Back Door. I just have developed a tradition of uh, taking a picture, a little selfie on my deck before I go. And it occurred to me, I was doing the same thing when I was a teenager, ready to go, but you can see how heavy I packed in the old days. Man, oh man, we've learned to pack light. Um, 
When I was a kid, I hiked on this ridge. And if you've ever been in a lecture that I've given about the wonders of European travel, you've heard me say, imagine tight roping on a ridge high above the valleys. On one side, you got lakes stretching all the way to Germany. On the other side, you got the most incredible alpine panorama anywhere, the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau. And ahead of you, you hear the long legato tones of an alphorn announcing that the helicopter stopped mountain head is open. It's just around the corner and the coffee stops is on. That was the magical moment I had there then as a kid. And my girlfriend Shelly and I were doing a vacation hiking in the Alps last year, and we decided to walk on that same ridge. Take some doing to get up there, but boy, oh boy, there it is, 50 years later, the same ridge, and it was just as magical then as when I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, I went to visit my relatives up in Norway, and Uncle Tor and Aunt Barrett made me this beautiful dish of krumkaka and Mm. That's one tradition that I took home, and I've been enjoying it ever since. I was there with my good buddy, Gene Openshaw, who's still on our staff. Gene helps us out on lots of our books. And back then, we had no money. This was, Arthur Fulmer said, $5 a day. We were doing it on $3 a day, plus our year rail pass. And um, uh, we'd drop in on relatives to get a good meal. Well, 50 years later, just this year, I dropped into Sandefjord, two hours south of Oslo, and Uncle Tor was still there at the train station meeting me, just like he did 50 years ago. And he still had a nice free dinner waiting for their long lost American cousin. It's so great to have relatives in Norway and drop by and see them. And I've been doing it with, with my beautiful relatives in Norway for 50 years. Back then I developed a passion for Europe, just a love of Europe. And I was journaling all the time before I was ever gonna be a travel writer. I was a piano teacher and uh, this is the last two pages of my journal when I was 18 years old, that very first trip. I don't know if you can see it. And this is when, I don't know, I was just crazy about journaling and taking notes. But if you look at that, you can see exactly where I slept every night. Half of the times it was free, half of the times I had to pay. And it, you can see the summation there, 70 nights in Europe, average 84 cents a night. Wow, 84 cents a night. Of course, half the nights were free. So if I had to pay for a room, the average was about $1.50 a night. It's a little more expensive now, but the idea that you can travel and travel well and not spend a lot of money stuck with me. In fact, I wrote a, uh, I put together a class. This is 1978 at the University of Washington, European Travel Cheap. If you can see, this is my homemade map and England is talking to us. England is saying, feel my fjords, caress my castles. And we've been feeling the fjords and caressing the castles ever since. In fact, just a couple months ago, my neighbors, Kara and Mike, were heading off on one of our tours. They went on our big 20-day tour, the best of Europe. They had a few days before and a few days after the tour. And I said, come on up. I want to help you plan your free days. And uh, it reminded me how exciting it is to be able to help plan people's trips and how important it is for smart travelers to be thoughtful and get the most out of every day and every dollar of their beautiful vacation. You know, uh, Europe Through the Back Door is the first book I wrote. This is the second edition. Uh, the first edition was 1980. Uh, what, 43 years later, 2023, Europe Through the Back Door is coming out in its 40th edition. So uh, in 43 years, 40 editions, and that is the How to Travel Guidebook. We're gonna be having a fun festival in February to celebrate the 40th edition of Europe Through the Back Door. And something in the first edition that I impressed upon people and something I impress upon people to this day, to have a good experience, you need to be an extrovert. Here was, this is me as just a, a, a schoolboy, and uh, saying, you know, if you see few, four cute guys sitting on a bench, ask them to scoot over. Seriously, get to know the locals. I've been saying that for decades and it works just beautifully. I had a budget travel class and that was all day Saturday. And then all day Sunday, I would teach an art for, and history for travelers class. It's been my dream for years to take that six hour class that I was teaching back in the 1980, early 1980s and turn it into a six hour TV show. And that's what we finally did after 20 years of collecting the, the uh, B-roll and, and the video clips to put together this sweep through the story of European art. We finally did it. And it's airing all over the United States right now. If you'd like to enjoy any or all of that six hour sweep through the story of Europe, you got it at ricksteves.com along with everything else we've ever made. If you've got a trip coming up or if you've enjoyed your travels and you wanna revisit some of the greatest art, Take advantage of this. It's just a delightful sweep through the story of Europe in six hours. 
you know, way back when I was a kid, my dad imported pianos from Germany. Here you can see his piano store. And uh, my little studio next is where I would teach piano. And back then my kids would do the recitals, but you can see that decorative thing on the wall behind the piano. That's actually a painted slide screen. I'd take down the musical staff and I would get rid of the piano students and their parents and I'd stick in that same room, travelers. That's the first classes I taught. And uh, I got to pack that little room. I don't even know how they got out of there. It looks like it's solid people and uh, share with them all of the things I learned. So I had to decide, am I gonna be a piano teacher? Am I, am I gonna be a travel teacher? Had my book, had my piano students, and I really decided I'm gonna end the piano teaching and teach piano. And that was 19, early 1980s. Still love the music. Just last week, we hosted the Symphonic Journey in Edmonds. Um, it's a, it's a, a symphony that goes to seven different countries around Europe. I'm booked in uh, 2024 so far to go to Cincinnati, Louisville, Naples, Florida, and St. Petersburg, Florida, as we continue to take our musical adventure on the road. If you'd like more information about that, stay tuned on our website. And if you want to see the show we produced 10 years ago, you can see that at, uh, in the TV section. Okay, so now the colored countries there, the darker countries are the ones that I visited this year. And, um, you know, it, I've done Monday night travels for each of these trips. There's three or four trips there. I'm not going to talk about Morocco tonight. I just did that a couple of weeks ago. But I do want to visit Spain, France, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, Poland, and Istanbul in Turkey uh, and France. So uh, let's go. Uh, pandemic, not a big deal this year. We took 30,000 people on our tours. Eh, it was a big deal for 2% of them because 2% of them got COVID on the tour and had to leave. Nobody went to the hospital, nobody went to the doctor, just had to isolate. Uh, the trajectory is very good. Uh, God willing, we'll be traveling without much concern of COVID next year, but I travel with a mask. And um, I know there's long distant, long lasting changes from COVID. You cannot kiss the toe of St. Peter at St. Peter's Basilica anymore. Look at it, it's worn down there after centuries of pilgrims traveling from all over Christendom to come there and, and kiss that toe. Can't kiss the Blarney Stone in Ireland either, which is actually a beautiful thing, if you know what the, the boys did to it the night before. Um, there's just hygienic improvements in Europe, um, and it takes a little of the romance, a little bit of the ambience away, instead of having a nice, uh, um, you know, um, vinegar and uh, olive oil uh, um, decanter or canter or whatever you call it, pitcher, you got individually wrapped doses, and instead of classic menus, you've got a QR code. It's all about being safer. But uh, boy, the people are out, and that is the good news. Uh, I, I went to Madrid. It was the first place I went to Europe this year, and I was so impressed just by the energy in the streets. And a uh, great thing about Madrid is, and like anywhere, it's just finding out the happening neighborhoods. Chueca is a great neighborhood, and you can see the metro takes you right there. If you get good with the public transit, you can just pop out anywhere in town and ask locals, use your guidebooks, but go to the happening neighborhoods and just make the scene. You don't need to have a lot of money. You don't need to have reservations or a lot of language skills. You don't even need a guide. All you got to do is find out where's that neighborhood and go there. And then in the case of Choi Cup, check out the Vermouth Bar. I just love eating and drinking and, and getting to know people in the Vermouth Bar. And when you are traveling, I think it's important to get into the ingredients. That's something that always reminds me when I'm in Spain. You can get a plate of jamón serrano for five or six dollars, or you can get a plate of jamón ibérico for 15 or 20 dollars. Life is too short to be eating mediocre cheese. I'd just like to take a moment here to be with my jamón ibérico. Just look at that. Seriously, if you've had that ham, you know what sort of ecstasy I'm enjoying right now. Okay, we can carry on, but that was beautiful. When you go to Spain, invest in the good ham. Invest in the good ham. That's what my local guide friends remind me. One thing I've been doing in my research is finding the Michelin-rated restaurants that are not Michelin stars. It's called Bib Gourmand in some countries. And I don't like a Michelin star restaurant. It's just too pretentious. And you got to make reservations long in advance. You got to dress up and spend a lot of money. I like the Michelin rated restaurants. That's where I find beautiful, beautiful croquetas like this. And I find a beautiful potato salad like that. This was a restaurant I found and recommended that's in our book now for Toledo. Um, I like to eat well, 
but I don't like to eat pretentiously. I like to be surrounded by smart locals rather than noisy tourists. And you do that when you choose a finer, smaller restaurant. Um, this is a very trendy bar in, in Madrid. I love it. You can see it's in my book. I'm halfway through an evening of updating a guidebook there, uh, Xing out some bad, but you can see there's sort of having a massacre on page 498. Uh, half of the page is Xed out, won't be in there next year, but the others are better than ever. Um, uh, when I went to this restaurant, they said, no, we don't have a spot. I wanted to eat there. So we sat at the bar, sit at the bar. If they say they're full, ask if you can sit at the bar. It's a great tip. Another great tip in Spain, be out late, be out strolling. That's where the action is. This could be any town, España, and find out where do the people stroll. That's the paseo and be part of the scene. Go to restaurants that have a handwritten, one language menu that's not very big, that's filled with locals. You know that's going to be a good value. Oh. I just love going out after dark in Spain. It's just got this energy, this love of life. Step into those bars. You need to um, get out of your comfort zone. If all you ever order is things on the menu that you know the name for, you're really limiting yourself to the boring dishes. You know, venture out, find out what they're excited about tonight and go for that and you will take home a better experience. I love getting a, a hotel in, in a town in Spain, like here in Sevilla, that's right in the center. Uh, many places are using the rooftops now for a nice terrace for breakfast. Uh, and then I like to be out late in my neighborhood because my hotel is centrally located. Here in any town in southern Spain, this happens to be Sevilla, you can find a bunch of kids marching through the street slowly, carrying what looks like a box spring. But they are practicing for the procession for Easter. And this is what kids do. They get into a team and they carry the floats. And when it comes to Semana Santa, Holy Week, they walk slowly shuffling together as a very coordinated team through the streets with a huge load on their wrapped up heads and shoulders. I happened to be there when there was a, a soccer game going on. The whole place was just mobbed with soccer fans. Uh, you got to roll with the punches when you're traveling. You never know what you can stumble into. You might stumble into the town like I did in Cordoba when it's the day that everybody shows off their courtyards and they love their flowers in Cordoba. Just a beautiful chance to be out and about. And remember, in your travels, you can find museums that focus on the work of artists that you didn't know were important to know. I just love finding a new artist as I'm traveling around, and then it adds to my ability to enjoy art in my travels. Remember, all over Europe, they're investing in their public transit, and in Spain, it's just really impressive with the Ave. You can get around. You don't need to fly from Madrid to Barcelona anymore. You take the train. People don't fly. It's just much easier to go from train station to train station, 150, 200 miles an hour on the local bullet train. All over Europe, you need to book things on your phone or on your computer in advance. You don't go to the train station to get your train ticket anymore. Get it online in advance. If you have trouble with that, get somebody to help you. I'm not that great with the tech stuff of ordering on my phone. Um, I went down to the, the hotel desk when I was in Granada and I bought this ticket uh, with the help of the hotel desk. They picked, uh, they, you know, they just uh, give them, I just gave them my credit card uh, number and uh, we printed out the ticket with the QR code and I am on my way. Another thing you'll find all over Europe, this, this is a takeaway after COVID, is Europe realized that they can control the crowds by requiring you to have a reservation. And uh, for instance, when you go to Granada, if you want to go to the Alhambra, you are not going to get in without a reservation in advance. And a good way to do that is to get the card in advance that includes the, reserv includes the palace. And then at that time, you make your appointment to get into that. But all over Europe, You'll find great palaces like this, the Royal Palace in uh, Sevilla, has every half hour an entry time and people book that in advance. You need to know in the cities you're visiting, which are the sites that require reservations in advance. Now that's not that common, but the major sites and attractions that you probably wanna see from Anne Frank to the Louvre, to the uh, Uffizi Gallery, to the Sistine Chapel, they probably require tickets with an appointment in advance and you do that online okay from spain we're going to head up to 
France. And I just visited my buddy Steve Smith, the co-author of our France book. And you've seen Steve give a number of talks here on Monday Night Travel. And it was just great to be in uh, the Côte du Jour, the south coast of France, in the springtime when things were comfortable. This is Nice, the major town in the south, impressed by how they're committed to public transit, how what used to be a busy traffic street is now a green belt. You hear the sound of birds unless there is a one of the um, uh, beautiful uh, trams that glide by every three minutes, one in that direction, one in the other direction, you've got trams and for a very good price, you hop onto that tram and you just, you master the town. It's like swinging from vine to vine. It's a beautiful thing when you commit yourself to public transit. With Steve's help, we were updating our guidebook on Southern France and on France, and uh, we really enjoyed checking out the latest in restaurants on the South coast of France. Remember, eat with the season. You know, if it's um, zucchini flowers, you'll find zucchini flowers everywhere. If it's porcini mushrooms in season, you'll find porcini mushrooms. And don't ask for zucchini flowers outside of zucchini flower season. Don't ask for white asparagus outside of white asparagus season. But if you're in Germany and everybody is talking about white asparagus, that's the thing to get. I love the salad niçoise. Oh, baby, look at that beautiful salad. Mm. When I look at that, I just, I can... I can vividly recall the tastes. Their vegetables are so tasty. I'm just looking at that. Oh, man. And the pan banier is a local sandwich in Nice that is basically a salad niçoise on a beautiful bread. That's quite a nice, quite a nice sandwich, a local style sandwich. If you want to learn about the food, and I'm no fancy gourmet, I can tell you that, take a food tour. I become really evangelical about food tours. Here's an um, entrepreneurial, hardworking tour guide who specializes in food. And she takes people around every morning. She's got her little roller trolley there filled with goodies for us to enjoy. And we go to seven or eight different gourmet holes in the wall. And we, with her help, get to try all the olives. And we get to go and try the pastries. And it's a beautiful experience. It's a big meal. Uh, and I'm a big fan of food tours all over Europe these days. Later on, I went into the absinthe bar and turned green. Absinthe. It's just a lot of fun to have going into the um, different characteristic corners of southern France. And with a good guidebook, you will enjoy Deli Belly. No, you'll avoid Deli Belly. That's what you'll do. Steve and I couldn't believe there's actually a restaurant named Deli Belly. Okay, we went, we did a lot of traveling in Iceland this year. And um, Iceland, uh, well, while we were focusing on the food in Spain and in southern France, in Iceland, this is a, a country that is just tapping in literally to its geothermal power. The whole place is heated by, by um, hot water. And uh, you'll see these amazing, amazing thermal baths. This is the most famous one, uh, the Blue Lagoon. And uh, this is just a neighborhood bath. And uh, the Blue Lagoon, this one cost about 10 times as much as this one. You will not see an Icelandic person here, I can promise you that. These are all tourists. This is the one that everybody has to go to. I don't blame you. It's an amazing place. It's right near the airport as you land or as you take off. Huge promotional budget, about $80 to, to soak in these thermal waters. Or for $6, you can soak in these thermal waters. Not a tourist in sight here. It's just locals hanging out together. Family fun. The great equalizer. Well, when you're in Iceland, you got nature, baby. And it is powerful nature. Part of it is because this is literally where America meets Europe. The two tectonic plates are coming together and you actually see the spot where the two tectonic plates come together. And that's where the Icelandic warlords gathered a thousand years ago before there was a modern Iceland, but they had some sense that this is an important place. Oh, there's so much power of nature you can enjoy when you're going around Iceland. And I just watched the rough cut of the TV show we filmed. It is marvelous. We have a one hour special on Iceland coming up and it's coming your way shortly on public television. Stay tuned because we really had fun. There you see the crew, Simon and Carl. That's a, that's, I like a small crew, just me, Simon and Carl. Uh, we had our right hand um, co-author with us, Cameron Hewitt in this case, because Cameron is our expert on Iceland. And here we were going up Torsmork. It's a beautiful opportunity to get into the middle of Iceland. Uh, they never know which way the rivers are going to flow. So they have bridges on wheels so they can help out the hikers and you don't have to take your shoes off and barefoot it across. 
but we had our four by four and we had, this is a, this is a vehicle that actually lets the air out of its tire from the driver's seat. So it gets more traction and then it pumps the air back in. It can do that just so it can get up, um, you know, fancy hills and so on. And it could go literally underwater. You can see that uh, pipe that lets the engine breathe from high above. It's just a powerful thing to be able to see nature with the help of locals. And we had a great time filming that. Again, stay tuned for a TV show coming your way on public television about Iceland. Was I, I was um, doing my research in Scandinavia and I just had so much fun visiting the capitals of Scandinavia. Excuse me, I just cannot sit here with this panettone right next to me. I'm just gonna take a bite. Mm. I hope you've got some nice little treats to enjoy while we're traveling together. Mm. Italian and Swiss, panettone, patty coco. I think it works. Okay. My producer, Simon, always says, take small bites when you're on camera. I just took a big bite. Because it's panettone, it's big bread. Okay. Um, but I did a blitz of the, well, not a blitz, I was there for three or four days each, of the capitals of Scandinavia. Updating for the guidebooks. This is Copenhagen. And Copenhagen, oh, they're all distinct. They're all great. But um, Copenhagen has its knee haven. That's the new harbor, literally, but it's actually the old harbor because when it was new, it was the first. So they call it the new harbor. It's like the Pont Neuf in Paris, the new bridge, it's the oldest bridge. But um, when you go to the knee haven, you'll find this used to be the place of bars and strippers and wild scenes and tattoo parlors. Now there's just one lonely tattoo parlor left and everything else is touristy. Uh, in fact, the tourists have pushed the locals literally across the canal and the locals now hang out across the canal and they enjoy the sun. They enjoy uh, different restaurants, uh, but there's room for tourists and there's room for locals. And as a tourist, we need to know that if we're surrounded by all the tourists, it's okay, but you can do better. Heading up to Oslo. I've been going to Oslo all my life. I don't even recognize the harbor anymore. Look at this. It used to be an industrial wasteland. Now, it is the most futuristic living quarters and they've designed it. I mean, you got a place to park your kayak. You got a little garden on the rooftop. You got a cafe on the ground floor. You got public transit. You got loner bikes everywhere. And you're right in the center of the town. You can swim off of the, you know, there's playgrounds for the kids right there. And they've got this actual tour. It's a tour that's got, um, you know, a, a route and different info posts. And every uh, few minutes you find one of these posts. This is info post number six. It tells you what it was like back when it was an industrial wasteland and what the vision is for it now. You can visit that by bike. All over Europe, you've got loaner bike programs. Some of them work, some of them don't for tourists. Oslo's is the best that I have ever encountered. And uh, for $10, you get a three day um, license for that. And uh, if you know what you're doing, you just grab a bike, it's free and you park it. As long as you use the bike for less than an hour, it's free and they're everywhere 24 seven. I mean, it's amazing. And it's a great sightseeing uh, tip. And that's of course, in the new edition of our Scandinavia guidebook. This is the thing in Oslo, floating saunas, floating saunas and locals love this. They just make an appointment, they drop by and in the middle of a work day or whatever, they'll steam in the sauna, they'll sunbathe and they'll jump into the fjord. And you find these every few minutes as you walk up and down the harbor in Oslo. Of course, if you want to nip into the library, they've got a state-of-the-art library, the Dykeman Library, right there next to the Opera House, five minutes walk from where, where you'll be as a tourist. And this is the new Monk Museum. It's the biggest museum in Europe dedicated to a single artist. And Edvard Monk gets the notoriety. He gets the honors. Edvard Monk, he's the guy who did the scream. And I went through that a little skeptical. How can you have such a big museum dedicated to the art of one man? Check this out and you will see why. Something I've long wanted to do in Oslo is to get to know the fjord. And I finally did with the help of um, one of our great local guides. And this is a modern Norwegian ferry. It is electronic. It's like a floating Tesla. And it goes just, it glides silently through the fjords from uh, island to island. These are cabin islands, they're called. Not too many people actually live there, but they're vacation destinations just 15 minutes away from downtown Oslo. 
Anybody can, for a couple of dollars, if you got a bus pass, it covers you on the ferry, you can tour the fjord. I wrote that up. It's a new tour in the next edition of our, of our Scandinavia guidebook. And when the ferry comes back to Oslo to dock and people all get out, that bla big black whale's tail kind of thing settles down onto the ferry, and that's a recharging post. And that recharges the electric battery so it can then, a few minutes later, glide up the fjord with its next batch of travelers. Amazing airports all across Europe and Scandinavia, and you can fly from Oslo to Tallinn, the capital of Estonia, in about an hour. Very inexpensive. And uh, here you got es uh, the capital city of the little country of Estonia, about a million people in Estonia. They've got uh, a Russian embassy. You don't need the address of the Russian embassy these days. You'll find it is the place with all of the angry posters outside. Because, of course, the Estonians do not support the Russian invasion of Ukraine. All over Europe, people are concerned about Ukraine. It's something that Europe seems quite adamant about. If they don't fight the Russians in Ukraine, they're going to be fighting them in countries much closer at hand. It's a complicated time, but it is, boy, it's, it's such an important time that we all stand together and recognize the brutality of Putin and the aggression of his move into Ukraine. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best place to put some of my tax dollars if you have a defense budget, because I'd rather defend our freedom there than closer to our own shores. But uh, uh, while Europe feels solidarity for Ukraine, a lot of travelers don't want to go to Eastern Europe these days. They don't feel comfortable going there. Tourism is down. I thought I felt very comfortable in Poland and in the Baltics. I wouldn't worry about that a bit. In fact, I felt good going to those countries and helping out their economies as they are taking a, a little bit of a hit because of that war. In Ukraine or in Estonia, they know what freedom is all about. They earned it hard and they earn it in their song parade grounds. This is the festival grounds where a third of the country gathers at one time, a third of the people in the country, and they sing songs. They sing songs to assert their independence and their freedom and to be there and to learn about that and to be inspired by it and then to enjoy what they're doing with their country today. It's rich heritage and it's beautiful modern residential areas in what used to be industrial rust belt zones. It's so exciting. This is the Rotterman Quarter in Estonia. And a few years ago, you wouldn't go in here. It was just a depressing um, uh, wasteland. And today it is vibrant. It is people friendly. They've turned all sorts of warehouses into beautiful, edgy, creative restaurants. And uh, I had such a lot of fun in uh, Tallinn, in Estonia, updating my guidebook, making sure we knew all the good markets, knew all the good restaurants. And then we cut the boat over to Helsinki, the capital of Finland. Helsinki is a beautiful country to visit. And you got to remember, all of these countries are easily connected by boat, by rail, and or by airplane. And uh, of course, Finland is right on the, it's got a long border with Russia. And this is where Slavic Europe rubs up against Germanic Europe. And you've got, uh, for instance, the uh, Protestant cathedral, the Lutheran cathedral, with its austere neoclassical interiors facing the Russian Orthodox cathedral with all of its incense and gilded icons and the iconostasis and so on. It's a beautiful display of culture. And then across the, the way from that, you've got Helsinki's new library. I don't know what it is, but all the Scandinavian capitals have invested in state-of-the-art libraries that raise the bar and what an, a library can contribute to a community. And to get a tour of this library in Helsinki, I rerouted my whole walk-in tour of the city in my guidebook to finish here at this great, great library. Here's the spiral staircase. I just typed a few of the words that you'll find on this staircase because it, the point is everybody is welcome. Babies, nappers, rappers, teachers, chubby, skinny, communist, the henpecked, the weary, the unemployed, and tourists. Everybody is welcome in the library. I just was so inspired by this beautiful, beautiful commitment to community, commitment to the weave of their society. Scandinavians, they pay high taxes. They get a lot of punch for every dollar they invest in their government because they have faith in their institutions. They know that there are certain things that are best done collectively, and they want a well-educated and a healthy populace. 
Respect for the heritage. Here we have the old market hall. Beautiful place today to get a bite to eat. A fish soup is a go-to standard as our open face shrimp sandwiches. Just delightful. And all over Scandinavia, people have what the Swedes call the fika. It's a cinnamon roll or a cinnamon bun and a coffee halfway through the morning. That's the pick me up they got and they know how to do cinnamon rolls. From Helsinki, it's just a quick flight or an overnight boat or an all day scenic boat ride to Stockholm. Look at Stockholm. I just love Stockholm. And it's a, just a great city to roam around in. It's got that peaceful Scandinavian sensibility where they don't want no stinking guns everywhere. Uh, it's got a well-preserved old town. Look at that. This is the, the uh, Gamlestan, uh, the, the main square in the old town. And uh, this lovely, lovely, well-preserved old town that we can explore. I found all over Scandinavia, a lot of people enjoying the Rick Steve Scandinavia guidebook. And they would help me as I'm roaming around looking at restaurants, because I can tell if this restaurant's in my book and this group of travelers is having a good meal, I can quiz them and see how it was, how's the service, how's the food, how's the price. And they loved it. They've been here twice in a row. Beautiful open face sandwiches, beautiful food courts. Now, this is a budget standby in Scandinavia, all over Europe, actually. Um, they have um, food courts and there's not a single chain restaurant in these food courts. You know, if you think of a food court in the United States, you go to the mall, it's all chains. Every one of the restaurants in the mall food court is a chain. In Scandinavia, in Germany, in most of Europe, they um, actually protect the environment for the little businesses. And these are all one-offs, or they are branches of local restaurants that are one-offs that really have a, a, a local following and know how to do good food. Here's another um, former um, market hall. I don't even remember exactly where this is, but this is an old industrial age market hall that now has more restaurants in it than merchants selling vegetables and fruit. Um, and when I was in Scandinavia, uh, Norway in particular, I was used to it being brutally expensive where I almost couldn't afford to eat. Now there's 12, there's 11 crowns in a dollar. It's actually no more expensive in uh, Norway, notorious as an expensive place than Germany or France. It's just normal prices now in Norway. For $20, you can get a beautiful uh, plate of food. And if you wanna save money beyond that, you can go to the grocery stores. Here we have uh, an interesting sign. It's a co-op grocery store. It's right across the street from my hotel in Oslo. And if I look at that sign, I see those numbers there. And if you look at those numbers, you need to kind of look at that as a traveler and go, well, what do those numbers mean? And you can look at that and go 5 to 01, and then in parentheses, 7 to 24. And you kind of go, well, that's awfully hot profile for some numbers. What would that be? And then I think, you know, I bet you that's the hours. I would bet it's open Monday through Friday from 5 until 1 a.m. And on Saturday, it's open from 7 till midnight. And on Sunday, it's closed. And in actuality, that's the case. Many travelers insist on being confused. Let me just be a little bit blunt here. Be engaged, figure it out, expect yourself to travel smart and you can, and you can, that's a beautiful thing. And when you go to a grocery store like that, you can put together a picnic and you can eat it in the park or you can eat it in your hotel room. It's fast, it's nutritious. I like it, it's a good meal for me and it's cheap. It's the same price as groceries in the United States. All over Europe, they're investing in their infrastructure they're going green. You've got a real emphasis on public transit and bicycles and to the detriment of people who want to drive downtown. Here we have a bike, a bike uh, park right on top of a subway station. You'll notice the bike parking lot is about two feet lower than the street level. And it just lets the bikes kind of disappear from view so they're not such an eyesore. But if you had cars on this scene, you wouldn't have a chance to walk anywhere. It'd be totally glutted. But here, instead of cars taking up space, you got bikes not taking up space and people are getting around just fine. Every country over there has great airports. There's a scam all over Europe that I want to remind you about. And it is um, to remember when you're using your credit card. And in many countries these days, especially in Scandinavia, cash is going out. I went 10 days without ever touching uh, currency or coins. Uh, in, in, in much of Scandinavia, children don't even know what coins are these days. Children get their allowance by having their parents swish their account on their phones. Um, we have Venmo, they have Swish. 
and kids would just say, mommy, swish me. And there is another, you know, 20 bucks in their uh, account for their uh, allowance. But I do want to remind you, when you do use your credit card, you will almost always have the option to have it in dollars or in the local currency. This would be Poland here. And it seems like it's presented like that's, uh, they're doing you a favor by letting you pay in the local currency. No, they're trying to rip you off. Never pay, or by, they're doing a favor by letting you pay in dollars. Never let them choose your exchange rate because it's generally going to be a bad exchange rate. Go with the local currency, not the dollars. You will save money. I got this slide here because it's time for Heidi Coco. Got the Christmas tree up. Mm. Wow. I want to have that with my crumb caca. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. Wow. I want to remind you, it is hot. It is hot. My cocoa is not very hot right now, but Europe is hot in the summer. I did a very good job of never cooking. I was traveling in hot places, southern Spain, southern France, Morocco, Turkey, never got hot. I did my Scandinavia and I did my Iceland in the middle of the summer. And this is one week during the summer in Stockholm or something like that. Just, you know, sunny and 70. I like that. And it was about the same temperature in Istanbul and Morocco because I did that off season. The stakes are high. Do what you can to travel without sweltering. Another thing I was impressed by, I thought the tourist information's office would be almost out of business these days. I found them quite helpful. In fact, here in Helsinki, I think this is, they've got um, tours, they've got free music, they've got all sorts of things going on, fun little extras for the travelers to welcome you. Here you can see a lot of music, you can see a lot of guided tours. Some of them are free and some of them are almost free. But, you know, dig for the information. You'll find that uh, a kind of a welcome when you're a good traveler and you check in with the tourist office. Also, a good traveler knows that everywhere you go where there's a commotion, there are pickpockets. I was at the Changing of the Guard in Stockholm, and I thought, I'm going to change my view. Rather than looking at the soldiers marching and the band playing, I'm going to step back and look at people's butts, just like a pickpocket. And here you see the view of the pickpocket. Which bag do I want to grab? Which purse can I rifle? Who's got a wallet sticking in their back pocket? You are being checked out when you're on the streets of Europe. I'm sorry to tell you, you don't need to be paranoid. You just need to be on the ball because if you're vulnerable, it could be an expensive mistake. These are the kind of tips that we pack into our books. We are so thankful for all the work our research have done this year. We spent three or 400 days of researching in Europe, visiting or attempting to visit every place in every book for every edition. And these books are the most lovingly updated books anywhere. I can promise you that it does make a difference. Plus, we get to go home with new taste treats. I love to make open face sandwiches. Um, this was my dinner that, I've, that I enjoyed eating when I shared my entire one hour take on Scandinavia on the old Monday night travel episode. As Gabe will be sure to remind you, we have more than 100 episodes in our archives. They're free, they're fun. There's no, well, there's ads that so we're always advertising our good stuff, but uh, I'll tell you, there's a lot of good information in that archive. And I've got, uh, must have four different hours on my travels in 2023. One of them is Scandinavia, and I'll give you my tips on making a good open face sandwich. So take advantage of that archive. All right, hey, we're gonna travel on. We're gonna go to Poland and we're gonna finish in Turkey. As I mentioned, we're not going to Morocco. I did a whole one hour in Morocco just a couple weeks ago. You can look into our archives and click on that and watch it whenever you have an hour and you wanna to go to Morocco for your uh, North African fantasy. Poland, we visited to make TV shows. We did a one hour show on Poland and two half hours and Poland is such a rich and beautiful culture. This is the sacred hill, the Babel Hill in, in Krakow, the historic capital of the country. The square, the main square is beautiful any time of day, but when the sun went down, it just sparkled. We did more twilight shooting in, in Krakow than I've ever remembered doing on a TV show. And Simon just really dug the light that we got to show. Uh, beautiful marketplaces all over Europe. I'm sort of into marketplaces now. Stokes my appetite, helps me get ideas for what I want to order in the restaurant. 
big news in Krakow was the uh, Leonardo da Vinci painting that is uh, beautifully displayed right there in Krakow. No crowds at all, just you and Leonardo da Vinci, the lady with the white ermine. Move over, Mona Lisa. Warsaw was bombed flat in 1945, hardly a building, building standing, and today it is totally rebuilt, um, thanks to Russian aid to a certain degree, and Stalin wanted to be sure that uh, Polish people in Warsaw had a nice reminder of how much Joseph Stalin loved them. So he uh, insisted on building this Russian-style skyscraper right in the middle of the town, and today it used to be the, the only skyscraper in town, now it's surrounded by bigger skyscrapers. But people nicknamed this old venerable skyscraper Stalin's penis. Um, I've got they put it on the uh, on the swag from the tourist office. They give you the socks with uh, Stalin's skyscraper um, that you can have running up your ankle. Um, this is a beautiful lane that leads to the old town, and it's just remarkable how all of these buildings were bombed out and rebuilt since 1945. Poland has a rich, rich musical heritage. This is the home of Frederick Chopin, Frederick Chopin. And uh, there's a park there and every Sunday in the summer, the people gather. It's a multi-generational, beautiful festival. And uh, it was everything I dreamed about for our TV work. And we filmed a beautiful bit of that park. I got to know the pianist a little bit and uh, that was delightful. And then we went to the hotel that we stay at with our groups when we have our Poland tours. And we got to shoot the Salon concert with a violinist and a pianist and doing, of course, Chopin, the hometown composer boy. It was a beautiful moment. The surprise for people who take our Poland trip is Gdansk, the town up on the north coast of Poland. And it is, look at this, that's the main street of Gdansk. This is a, a block over, and that was the street that was bombed out. You can see it's rebuilt in the medieval style, but with modern buildings. It is a delightful place to be and to stroll, and uh, it's thriving now, Poland. Uh, I just, God, I'm just so sad about wars going on right now. This is a time we're supposed to be celebrating peace and brotherly love and all of that. And it's just heartbreaking what's happening when you know that there's no winners in war and you know what's happening to people in Ukraine, and the tragedy of being in the wrong side also, what's happening to people in Russia, what's happening in Gaza, and what's happening in Israel. Um, it's a time to think and pray about peace, I think, and when we travel, we see what peace can do. Poland's got peace now, and, it, and life is good in Poland. They don't have as much money as we have, but they're every bit as content and, 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 and filled with hope and and possibility uh, i just love that about travel so does my good friend cameron hewitt uh, if you know monday night travel you know cameron he's been with us every time we're going to eastern europe it's i hope cameron's um, at the wheel he's our man celebrating eastern europe in fact eastern europe is now called central europe our new eastern europe book just just this month is out with the title central europe uh, because that's the proper name for what we consider eastern europe because of the cold war and the iron curtain but Cameron was with us filming in Poland and in Iceland. And you can see Cameron's report on both of those countries in our Monday Night Travel archives. I'd like to finish our sweep through my travels in 2023 uh, with one more reminder that you've got an hour on each of these trips uh, in the archives for Monday Night Travel. But I'm just kind of going through some of my favorite moments. And this is baby, baby. This is Istanbul. 15 million people coming in a pharaonic airport. I mean, like the size of the pharaohs. I don't use the word pharaonic very often, but when you go to the Istanbul airport, you think pharaonic. And uh, it's a city again with 15 million. Every time I was overwhelmed by the crowds, I just go, well, there's 15 million people. It's pretty good when you consider how much chaos they could have if they weren't well organized. This is the Galata Bridge. That's the Golden Horn. I spent, and this is their iron-fisted right-wing autocrat Erdogan, and I wanted to feel the pulse of Turkey with Erdogan in power because uh, he's sort of against the spirit of Ataturk, who was much more pluralistic and much more secular. Erdogan, like we would have a Christian nationalist uh, if we had a right-wing autocrat. Um, uh, in Turkey, it would be a Muslim uh, nationalist. In India, it might be a Hindu nationalist. Um, you, you, you've got all of this nationalism that kind of ties in with with organized religion, and it's just ugly. I, I don't think there's anything 
Christ-like about Christian nationalism, frankly, uh, nor do I think there's anything Mohammed-like about Muslim nationalism, but uh, we have that dynamic now when you have leaders like Erdogan uh, fighting the, what do you call it, the pluralism that was championed by Ataturk. I love Ataturk. And in Turkey, you've got a respect for Ataturk. And you've also got an understanding that you got 15 million people in the city. How are we going to organize it? And, you know, people like Mussolini because the train ran on time. And people like Erdogan because they've got a new cruise port. I mean, here's the cruise port. It's pretty dang good, i got to say. These people are enjoying the cruise port, and there's no ship docked in right there, so they don't have the wall. But you see that long, skinny uh, feature in the sidewalk there? That is a sinking wall. And if there's a ship in, that goes up to provide the customs security, and then nobody can see the water. But it's a beautiful, beautiful people-filled uh, harbor front now. Um, the Golden Horn is a, a, a green beltway instead of an industrial wasteland. Uh, the Hippodrome is more beautiful than ever. And there's wonderful public transit in Istanbul. But there's creeping religious fundamentalism. And uh, women are wearing scarves now, much, much more than they were in the past. Many districts, it's rare to find a restaurant that serves alcohol. Uh, because that goes counter to the Muslim dominant faith. Uh, if there is a restaurant that's in a trendy neighborhood that wants to be a little bit of a maverick, they will serve alcohol and they'll advertise it because people want to want to drink. And it's hard to find that in a lot of neighborhoods in Istanbul. Uh, the Hagia Sophia, the greatest mosque. Oh, what a mosque. What a church. This was a started out as a church, then it became a mosque. It's the greatest church in Christendom for 400 years, I think. Uh, and then when the Muslims booted out the Christians, um, you got the minarets added, and it was a great mosque. And then in modern times, it became a museum. And just in the last couple of years, it was turned into a mosque again. Uh, and it is filled with worshipers. During the call to prayer, you got the church full, the mosque full, and you got people outside with their prayer rugs. Stepping inside, I kind of like it. It's, a, it's a, a lively place of worship, as well as a place of historic and cultural interest for tourists. And uh, it's part of travel. Uh, you'll find volunteers that would love to talk to you about their faith and who would love to just be your friend. And I thought it was a great, great thing. I got to know this young woman and she was delightful. She answered my question. She took me around the mosque and um, helped me enjoy a place that she really understands. Hagia Sophia, the greatest mosque in Turkey. Uh, Turkey has horrible inflation. In fact, for the first time ever, we are not using local currencies in our new edition. We are using uh, dollar approximations. Because if you were to say this meal costs 70 Turkish dirham uh, or lira, um, that would be meaningless because next year it would be 150 Turkish lira. The inflation is almost double every year. I mean, it's massive. So they've got uh, changeable menus. You can just wipe off the prices and put on new prices. And we're, for our guidebook, saying about $5, about $10, about $15. It's cheap. This is the main drag, Istikol Kladasi. And I just love being swept away in a sea of people when I'm in a city like Istanbul. Wow, I'm one happy traveler in a mob scene like this. You can immerse yourself in the wonders of Istanbul. And whenever you're hungry, there are so many fun places to eat. This is a cafeteria kind of place, very typical Turkish. You grab a tray and you point at what looks good. And there's always something that looks good. And this particular man has been serving me my sutlach, my rice pudding, for 30, more than 30 years. I've been coming to the pudding shop. I was there as a backpacker uh, when I was heading off to Istanbul, from Istanbul to Kathmandu. And he was there to bid farewell to all those um, travelers across Asia. If you want an intercontinental um, uh, day, you can take the boat in half an hour across to Asia. Just cost about a dollar. And uh, we've got some beautiful walking tours in the Asian side of Istanbul. And of course, you'll want to go to the Grand Bazaar. The Grand Bazaar is like an incredible shopping experience. And I had a good time updating my guidebook there, meeting people that have been in my guidebook for 20 years. This man is the goldsmith. And he's right there, like it says in the book. And you can meet him and you can watch him work. What I was so thankful about all across Europe this year is the fact that the energy is in the streets. It's a beautiful thing. The energy is in the streets. And um, um, if you equip yourself with good information and expect yourself to travel smart, you can. That was the same what I learned with these travelers with our book in Istanbul. And I met people with our books in every country we featured today. And they are doing it themselves with that good information and enjoying a rich experience.
Of course, I met a lot of our tour groups. We took 1,200 groups around Europe this year, 30,000 people. And this is one of those groups. And when I look at this group and I look at the smiles on those faces, there's Mine. She's the guide, the woman on the far left, Turkish guide, Mine. I had her when I took my Turkey tour ages ago, and she's still doing a great job. I want to remind you, we've got a special, we've got 26,000 seats sold for next year out of 32,000. So um, we're getting to the point where we're almost sold out, but we still got, well, we've still got 5,000 seats left. Um, and what we're doing is a little fundraiser for uh, Christmas. It's called Seasons Givings. And uh, you, you, if you sign up for a tour between now and the end of the year, uh, $100 of what you pay is going to go to your choice of four different charities. Um, there's uh, Civil Liberties, there is Environmental, there is um, uh, Helping Disadvantaged Young People Go to Europe, uh, and there is uh, Climate Change. So uh, you've got lots of opportunities there to choose how you want to earmark your gift. Uh, but if you're going to sign up for a tour, uh, you pay the same, but we're going to take $100 out of what you, you give for the tour, and we're going to invest it in good nonprofits doing work that you want to direct it to. Last year, we raised about $400,000 doing this, and we're going to raise $400,000 this year doing that because several thousand people are going to sign up between now and the end of the year and take advantage of that opportunity to make your Christmas a little bit special by earmarking 100 bucks towards the uh, good cause of your choice. Also, I want to remind you that um, last year we did um, a festival of Europe. We had uh, uh, 20 days in a row. This is last year's schedule where we had a festival each night, like a Monday night travel every night for three weeks. We're going to do it this year, but we're not going to do it in a, such a, a long version. We're going to do it in eight days, starting and ending with a Monday night travel, starting on uh, January 22nd and finishing on the 29th. And we'll do our seven most popular destination talks during that week, every night, uh, talk at six o'clock Seattle time. And it's a chance to crow about how great our tours are. If you're curious about tours for 2024, you'll be hearing more about that because we love to travel and we love to help other people travel the way we do. Okay, so that's what we've been up to um, uh, uh, this year. Uh, you know, uh, sort of a takeaway from my travels in 2023 is togetherness. When we travel, we connect. Look at these kids swinging in a circular swing set. And I thought this is in Iceland. That um, beautiful structure in the back is the uh, National Cathedral of Iceland in Reykjavik. But I thought, wow, when I was a kid, I wish I could swing toward my friends. And we just had fun in and out and in and out. Uh, when you travel around Europe, you see this notion that, that the best thing we can do is sit together and talk. Um, this is a brand new feature of Oslo's harbor front. And it's right there in front of the Nobel Peace Center, and it's called the Peace Bench. And you cannot sit on that smile-shaped bench without sliding together. And in the pavement in front, you can see a quote by Nelson Mandela. The best weapon is to sit down and talk. Amen. That is such a beautiful sentiment right now for this time when we want to think about how we can make this world an even more beautiful place. Our travels, if they're done right, help us to sit down and talk. That is why I like travel so much. Let me remind you another thing we've got going on. This is just a, a time every year that we raise a million dollars for Bread for the World. And this is our opportunity to inspire other people to get on board and help. It's easy to look at the news and be overwhelmed. We are making a difference. For 30 years, I've supported a lobby organization in Washington, D.C. That, that advocates for hungry people. The word lobby is not a bad thing. Lobby means speaking up with our legislators to hope that they will make laws that are mirroring our values. And my value, and I would imagine yours too, is that there's enough money in this world where people don't need to be hungry. It's just a matter of distribution. It's a matter of government policies. And this is an organization I'm supportive because I believe Bread for the World leverages my charitable giving more powerfully than anything else I can imagine. I cannot impress upon you how powerful it is to empower bread to talk with our legislators who want to do the right thing about the importance of being aware of the impact on our government trade policies on people who are hungry, both in our country and in developing countries south of the border. Well, here's the deal, and I do this every year, and every year we meet our goal. I try to talk 
inspire, let's put it that way, 5,000 people into giving $100 to Bread for the World. And if you do, I will match your gift up to $500,000. Every year it works. We're up, we've got more than 4,000 people on board this year. We're up well over $400,000. My goal, and I just trust we're going to get there, is to get some more people on board so we can empower Bread for its work with a million dollars. And that will make a huge difference in government trade policy, both here in, and, and, and policies towards hungry people, both here and internationally. As a little added advantage, we're gonna give anybody who um, donates $100, if they would like, uh, my art series and our Europe planning map, or my Christmas gift set with my Christmas book, my Christmas CD and my Christmas special, a little three pack of wonderful Christmas gifts. So if you want, there is, you can find out more about that on our website. Um, Gabe has put um, very important links in the chat section with all of these specifics and you can learn more about that. If you just go to bread.org, you can find out all about that. Hey, um, that is really uh, what I've got to share with my travels this year. And uh, Gabe, I think it's time for some Q&A. All right, Rick, it is time to get to Q&A. Um, before we do so, did you have any other word from our sponsor? You know, I think I've been babbling on about all sorts of things that we're into. I think, uh, I, I hope people have been listening. And uh, I guess I'll remind people that we do have um, our holiday sale on now where everything's 20% off. And uh, you've got links to all sorts of exciting things um, in the chat section. We have an advent calendar for travelers. Every every day there's a different window that'll that'll help you celebrate Europe, uh, uh, the holidays in a different culture. That's a fun thing. Um, I think that does it. Um, Gabe, how about some questions? Yes, and I've been loving our advent calendar. I check it every single day. Um, so Rick, in honor of the Christmas season, I have some questions of Christmas past, present, and future for you. Um, so, one question of Christmas past. Alex is wondering, as you watch the uh, Christmas special, what feelings does it bring up to see, you know, these videos of yourself in Europe all those years ago and videos of your family? Mm, well, thank you. That's, it's the thing about Christmas, isn't it? Isn't it? We just get warm and cuddly. And when I look at, at our kids, in fact, my daughter Jackie's visiting right now from LA and um, my grandson is here. And, um, uh, you know, Atlas is one year old now, and it's just, I'm, I'm just in a great mood. But I look at that, and you all look back at what sort of experiences you gave your kids growing up. And, and uh, travel is a beautiful experience to bless your children with. Um, I also, I look at the stubby little, the, the cute little fingers of the kids pressing little glittery things into the cookies. Uh, the little intimate stuff. A little child with his mother stirring the pot. You know, children just lapping up the culture and the love and the heritage through their families, this generation to generation thing. I just love that. And I just love how in Europe, they're not counting the shopping days left until Santa Claus arrives, you know. Of course, there's commercialism, but in Europe, they're just a little more thoughtful than that. And in Europe, you've got, you've got a lot of beautiful music. You've got a, people taking a moment and just enjoying the season, whether you're a person who cares about going to church or not. It's a beautiful time. And uh, you get that when you travel. And I appreciate home more. I appreciate how when we travel, we get tuned into the humanity of it all and how we're all in this together. So that's what I enjoy about watching this. And I'm so thankful we get to run it every year. Rick, we also have a question from Mayra who is wondering, um, as you traveled this year and as you've traveled since the pandemic, which city or country in Europe do you feel like has most changed just over these past five years? Hmm. Well, over the past five years, excuse me, I had a crum cocker sitting there. I had to eat it. <laughs> um, over the past five years, I think Scandinavia has changed. Um, the, the, the cities, they're just brand new and they're brand new in a way you go, yeah, that's really good. You know, there's a lot of cities that are brand new and they go, huh? But in Scandinavia, it's, yeah, that really works. And I just, I just want to be inspired by that. Of course, yeah, that's, that's how I would answer that. There's a lot of cultures that are very stable. And I like that too. I mean, you know, 
I wondered if Marrakesh would be as magical as when I went there as, you know, 30 years ago. And the answer is yes. It's got the same magic. It's got the same lovable chaos. Um, but um, I really think I like the modern comforts and I like the way Scandinavia does it. John was noting as you went through your travels that it seems like you typically have a very structured plan for your trip. Um, and he was wondering, have you ever done more of a fly by the seat of your pants trip? And is that even something that's feasible for travelers today to just yeah. take the train that suits them and find a place to stay once they get there? Uh, when I was a kid, I had my rail pass. Literally, I would stand on the track. There'd be a train going in that direction. There'd be a train leaving here. This one's leaving in six minutes. That one's leaving in eight minutes. And I was kind of seeing, who's getting on that train? Who am I going to be hanging out with in that train? You know, uh, do I feel like that? And then I'd have to jump on it. I mean, it was that sort of way. And I really enjoyed that. The downside of my success as a workaholic travel teacher is I really value the responsibility of every day I have in Europe to get the most out of it. So I've got a, I've got the wonderful burden of learning as much as I possibly can and writing it up and bringing it home. Um, and again, the downside is I, I just, I'm not comfortable wasting, not wasting time, but being free as a, free as a bird. And the irony is that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a plus if you're a traveler. So I, I have to write about it, but I don't, I don't practice what I preach in that regard. So when I was a kid, I did it. It's tougher to do it now, to be honest. You can do it, but the cost of hotels are so high and there's so many people going to the same places that generally you're wise to get yourself nailed down. Just, you gotta pin down the nights. And then you don't need to get everything figured out other than that, but I do believe you, you generally have to pin down the nights. But you don't have to either. I was just enjoying a friend of mine who's um, a guy named the Paddle Pilgrim. Uh, Dave Ellingson, and he's been on, I think he's been on Monday Night Travel, and we've had him on my radio shows, and he kayaks down great rivers. And he was just kayaking down the Mekong River in Southeast Asia. And he realized two days into the trip, he wasn't going to be making the, the, the enough miles on his paddle to go to the places he thought he was going to be. And the whole trip turned into an ad lib thing. And I, I saw his whole presentation, and he had a great time. And he was traveling, he's 75 years old. And he was traveling the way I traveled when I was in Southeast Asia back in my 20s. And he did it just like no big deal. That's how I travel. So people still do it. But I think we're, we're, we're different now. We're more risk averse. We're more demanding of our time. We're more, we, want, we don't want to have the stress of not knowing we're going to sleep tonight. I used to do tours without reservations for hotels, believe it or not. And I'd have 20 people on the bus and uh, I, I hadn't figured out where we're going to sleep tonight. And uh, I, I wanted to do that just to let Americans know the anxiety of not, not knowing if you're going to have a bed tonight. And we always got a bed, but um, people could not relax. Nobody could uh, listen to my talks afternoon if we didn't know where we we're going to be sleeping tonight. They just were too stressed out. So I, I just had to, I changed that. But it was a reminder that we're pretty um, privileged to know where we're gonna to sleep tonight. And much of the world doesn't. They don't know if they're gonna have water in the morning, you know? And that's a beautiful thing to learn when we travel. Well, Rick, we, we haven't had a paddle pilgrim on yet, but he is on our brainstorm list. So ah, maybe on great. Monday night travel soon. He is great, he is great. Rick, we have time for a couple more questions. One, a question of Christmas present. Um, some people were saying in the Q and A today that after weeks of literal and figurative rumblings in Iceland. Um, the volcano there has started to erupt as of this afternoon. Yeah. Um, and obviously we, it's a developing situation, but I'm curious for you, as a traveler generally, things happen in Europe and how can you be nimble and yeah. roll with the punches? You know, I don't just go around with my eyes closed and stumble into trouble, but I don't overreact to things like that. I mean, people ask me, what about the visa they're gonna charge in Europe? I say, well, tell me what, call me back when it's actually happening. What about the fee they're gonna to charge to go to Venice now? Call me back when it's actually, people have been stressing out over that for years and it still hasn't happened. I was in Morocco after the earthquake, it's a tragic thing, but it's a country the size of, I don't know, it's the size of what, Montana, I think. And it's, um, and uh, with 20 or 30 million people. And it was tragic for one little corner of the country. And it was horrible for the people whose villages were hit, but 
it shouldn't stop your trip to Morocco. I was so glad I went and I went to very close to the um, where the earthquake was and I learned a lot and I contributed to the economy and it was a great experience. Um, when I was leaving Reykjavik, uh, the big buzz was, oh, the uh, earthquake or the uh, volcano is going to erupt. Um, I didn't I let other people worry about it and I just skated right through it. I didn't give it a second thought. Um, I'm not I don't know what the right answer is, but I don't spend a lot of time worrying. Uh, I know the world's a big place and bad things happen, but uh, but uh, you got to really be unlucky to be in the wrong spot at the wrong time. And uh, one last question, Rick, comes from Susan, uh, a question of Christmas future. She is wondering, can you look into your magic eight ball and tell us what your travel predictions are for 2024? What are going to be some some new up and coming hot spots? Uh, what are your travel predictions? Hot spots are wherever your travel dreams are taking you. You know, and uh, I just want to have the information there so that when your travel dreams are taking you to Spain, when they're taking you to Greece, when they're taking you to Scotland or they're taking you to Norway, we've got the information for you. So tune into your travel dreams and be bold and be prepared and reach out for the information. My next trip is going to be taking um, 25 of uh, tour guides in Europe that want to be Rick Steves tour guides. They are all um, established professional guides, but they want to work for us. And I'm not going to let that happen until they get to be my tourists. I'm going to be their guide and we're going to spend a week together in Italy and I'm going to teach them everything about how we do tours. It's going to be so fun. I do that every winter and it's called our guide mentoring tour. And it'll be a great way to replenish our ranks of tour guides and get some great new guides in there. Hey, Gabe, we've got five more minutes of uh, Christmas. We're going to go to Switzerland. And um, can I roll that now? Go for it. All right, and then we will sign off in five minutes. But boy, it is this has been fun for me to share my uh, thoughts about traveling in 2023 and dream about 2024. And right now, we're going to take you back for one last chapter of the uh, Rick Steves European Christmas. I do want to remind you, it's a one hour show. You've seen about 12 or 14 minutes of it after the evening's up here. And uh, check it out. Gather the kids together, go over to Granny's and uh, and give yourself an hour of European Christmas. It is a beautiful, beautiful time, uh, a beautiful part of many people's annual Christmas celebrations. Right now, we're going to go to um, Switzerland and my family's going to fly over from Seattle just for three days. They flew over just for three days. It was a torrent filming schedule. They did a great job and let's see what happens. High in Switzerland, where the churches are small and villages huddle below towering peaks, the mighty Alps seem to shout the glory of God. Up here, Christmas fills a wintry wonderland with good cheer. In these villages, traditions are strong. I got to tell you, we are hoping and praying for snow on this thing. It was a very warm winter, the one we filmed. We got snow in Switzerland. It made all the difference. Ollie, my good friend, Ollie, who you've seen in our shows over the years, I, he was our fixer in our little village of Gimmelwald, where we love. And I said, Ollie, I need a man, an old man that looks like a troll chopping short pieces of wood for the little stoves they have in their houses. Ollie lined this up. I said, Ollie, I'd love to go down the slopes on one of those Swiss wooden bicycles. And uh, they have bicycle skis. You're going to see that in a minute. And Ollie, I'd love to go with my kids and cut down the perfect Swiss Christmas tree. And Ollie lined all of this up. I'm so thankful. It was just such a beautiful thing to have Christmas high in the Swiss Alps in the place you know I know and love, Gimmelwald. And warmth is a priority. Ovens are small, so wood is too. My family has arrived for a Swiss Alps Christmas. Along with our kids, Andy and Jackie, my wife Anne has joined me here in the tiny village of Gimmelwald, where we're having some fun with our friends, Ollie and Maria, and their kids. Ollie's taking us high above his village on a quest to find and cut the perfect Christmas tree. <laughs> what do you think? I like your line, Ollie. Yeah, this is a good tree. I think we should cut it. Yeah. 
So if you look at that tree, you can kind of see Ollie had it pre-cut. I, I even thought we actually found it and cut it, but Ollie had gone up there the day before and figured out what tree we were going to have, and it was cut already. And it was just, he was a, he was an angel. He was this, he just helped us out. Still high above Gimmelwald, we're stopping in a hut for a little fondue. We've got the tree. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a bit of work. Mm. This feels just right in the winter, oh, doesn't so it? Good. Yeah. When it's cold mm. outside, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> Fiku gaggle means um, fondue is good, ukita kuti luna. And it, it's, um, it means in English, um, fondue is delicious and gives a good mood. So if you have a party, you know that it's going to be. Yes, everybody knows what fiku gaggle means. If there's if there's yes. fondue, it'll be a good ambience. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. If there's fondue, figo gecko. You know you're going to have a good time. I really had this dream of having condensation on the windows looking in from outside just to show the gemutlichkeit. That's a, a, a German and a Swiss and an Austrian sort of notion of coziness. And we certainly had gemutlichkeit. You'll see looking through the window with the condensation and, the, and you can almost feel the laughter warming you up. This is so exciting. And then the sun was going down. Our dream was to get the sleds and the torches going down these, the Alps and the giggles of the children. And you have that twilight window and it all had to be there. And remember, this is public television. We don't have a lot of money. We have one cameraman. So he would go, we'd go buy him and he'd go, okay, stop. And then he'd run down the hill and he'd set up and we'd go buy him again. And he'd go, stop. And we'd go again. And I'm just, everything worked out perfectly. And uh, I just am so thankful for the crew and for our family to come over and be part of this to, to just help us feel the joy of a traditional Switzerland Christmas. It's impossible not to linger in this cozy setting. Before we know it, the light outside begins to fade. Here's to happy Christmas. Yeah. Woo. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> As the sun sets, we've got our tree and take an unforgettable ride home to Gimmelwald. Back in the village, the kids take the tree home, and we've been invited to enjoy another Christmas tradition. While I grew up opening windows on a paper advent calendar, up here, the windows are real. 25 homes decorate a window for each day of advent. The sense of anticipation is the same as day by day, Christmas approaches. Advent is all about anticipation. And for the kids, much of that anticipation is about presents, rewards for being not naughty, but nice. And as we've seen throughout Europe, each culture seems to have its own version of Santa Claus, who serves parents by providing children incentives for good behavior. Here in the Alps, it's Sami Klaus, that's Swiss German for Saint Nicholas, and his sidekick, Smoochli. I do want to remind you, there is a gifty little book called Rick Steves European Christmas. And on page 37, you have the family tree of Santa Clauses from country to country and all of their mean little sidekicks like Smoochley. Lots of everything you want to know about European Christmas is in this book because there's lots that we learned that we couldn't put in the TV show. This is a Christmas that children in this little village, a humble little village where almost everybody has the same last name. This is a Christmas they'll never forget. Smoochley needed a translator. My son, Andy, is playing Sami Klaus this year. Ollie's son, Sven, is playing Smoochley. And the donkey is playing 
himself. Each year, Gimmelwald's children anticipate a visit from this dynamic Christmas duo. Sami Klaus surprises the children and checks in his ledger to see if they've been doing their chores. Have you been feeding the cows lately? Then he might ask for a song or a poem. Sing. What would you like to sing? Take me dein in Segen, ein in jedes Haus. Geht auf allen Wege, mit uns sein und aus. And the performance is always followed by a treat oh, from good. his big bag of gifts. Well, hope you have a Merry Christmas. Frohe Weihnachten. See you next year. Adia. Bye. <laughs> So now we're back in the family. Grandma and Grandpa have been invited, and they've got candles on their Christmas tree. They've got an old Martin Luther Bible, just like we have the King James Bible. The German-speaking people have the Martin Luther Bible. And uh, you've got this chance to have Grandpa's hands on that old printing that just reminds me of a Durer painting. This is the, the most beautiful Swiss Christmas. And accomplished, and it's time for dinner. Back home, Grandma and Grandpa have joined the gang as we settle into a classic Swiss Christmas Eve. After dinner, both our families gather in the living room. Lighting the candles is a treat our children will always remember. Three generations come together as Grandpa reads from the old family Bible. Jedermann ging, dass er sich schätzen ließe, ein jeglicher in seiner Stadt. Da machte sich auch auf Josef aus Galiläa, aus der Stadt Nazareth, in das jüdische Land, zur Stadt David, die da heißt Bethlehem. The evenings capped off with the sharing of gifts. <laughs> hey, Gabe, I think that's all the Christmas we can share today of Europe. Obviously, I could talk and talk and talk. It's just so much fun <laughs> to have everybody together as we enjoy the holiday season together. Well, we certainly got our fill, Rick. Thank you for that tour. And I want to remind everybody to join us for the Festival of Europe in January. All right, everybody. everybody. Happy holidays. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick. Good night, everybody. Happy holidays. See you in the new